Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Earl and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you experience technical difficulties during the WebEx session, please dial 1-866-779-3239 or you can message me using the QA panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in the listen-only mode and as a reminder, this event is being uh, recorded. Um, we will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. We encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the QA panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Please keep the drop-down option as all panelists. We are going to start with a video. If you would like to listen to the music, you will have to listen to your computer speakers. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ecolab Food Safety and Public Health Webinar. My name is Valerie Hurd. I'm a Marketing Director at Ecolab Food Safety Specialties, and I'm going to introduce our topic today, and then I'll turn it over to the presenters. Today's topic is Overlooked Food Safety Issues. Next slide, please. So here's a little background uh, on our topic. Food service operators are doing their best every single day to minimize the food safety risks that exist in their operations. Uh, this is not only to protect their customers, but it's also to protect their business. But despite their best efforts, uh, some unsafe conditions may still exist. And some of these may be caused by the overlooked issues uh, that we're going to review today. These issues can be found in many areas of a typical food service operation, and the risks are real. We know that one in six Americans get a foodborne illness each year. Many of these uh, illnesses originate in food service operations. And there are 12 and a half million people in the United States with food allergies and more than 200 deaths a year from food allergens. So today we're going to discuss some of these overlooked areas and the risks uh, that they present. And then we're going to review some practical information on the causes of the problems and the best practices to help overcome these risks. Go to the next slide. So we have nine overlooked food safety areas that we're going to review. We're going to start with warm cold storage areas then cooking pans that are too deep, non-calibrated thermometers, the improper handling of produce, poor sanitation in ice machines, the storage and handling of cocktail garnishes, self-service areas like buffets and condiment stations, allergen isolation, and then finally drink dispensers. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to our presenters, and our presenters today are Ruth Petron of Ecolab and Cindy Rice from Eastern Food Safety. Welcome, Cindy and Ruth, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Valerie, and may I add my welcome to all of you. 
uh, joining us virtually. This is Ruth Petran, and I am the technical food safety lead in food safety for Ecolab. Earl, can you help me? There we go. Okay, as Valerie mentioned, our first issue that we want to talk about today that may be overlooked sometimes is the fact that cold storage areas may be too warm. And really this gets down to the fact that sometimes these cold storage areas may exceed the requirement of being at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below. We know based on health inspection reports that this is cited rather frequently and perhaps as many as 14% of the time per the recent data we've looked at. Now from a food safety standpoint, this can be serious. We know, for example, that pathogens like Listeria monocytogenes can grow at temperatures below 41. This graph over here on the right-hand side indicates modeled growth of Listeria in a model food system over the course of days and that food being held at 41 degrees. And we could see with a starting population of about 10 cells per gram, it doesn't take very long, say in 10 days, for those numbers to increase from 10 to 10,000. And that can be a hazardous uh, situation and certainly pose food safety risks. The other situation that can happen if cold storage is too warm relates to the formation of histamine, which often occurs with improper refrigeration of seafood items. And in fact, there's a recall that was just announced yesterday uh, related to this uh, of yellowfin tuna because there have been multiple reports of histamine poisoning that have resulted from consumption of this, most likely tied back to improper cooling of that fish. It could be related to cold storage areas being too warm. Certainly there's food quality concerns if we don't properly cool our storage areas, resulting in quality defects like we're seeing on the bottom of the slide with yeast and mold uh, and other spoilage type organisms. So that's the science, but I'll bring in my colleague Cindy now to talk about, well, what do we do about this? Thank you, Ruth. It, it helps to look at the causes for these um, unsafe practices in very busy restaurant environments. And a common cause for warm storage areas include things like overstacking refrigerators with food items or not allowing enough space between the items. Um, overstacking your coolers results in the cold air not being able to circulate as, as freely as it should around and underneath these containers of food. Um, refrigeration experts have said that perhaps 75% full is the ideal capacity for a walk-in or a reach-in refrigerator to allow cold air to circulate um, easily amongst the items. Frequently opening doors all day long will allow cold air to escape, and refri refrigerating foods while they're too warm also contributes to the warmer cold storage areas. So what can we do about that? Well, some best practices include setting your, the temperature, the ambient temperature, air temperatures inside these refrigeration units to between 35 and 37 degrees, just a little bit colder than the food temperature that we want to achieve, which is 41 degrees Fahrenheit or colder for TCS foods. And uh, TCS foods, TCS, of course, as you know, stands for time and temperature control for safety foods. These are the ones which can allow bacteria to grow if the temperatures are too warm because they're high in proteins or carbohydrates, they're moist and not too acidic. We want to try not to overstock our coolers and freezers for this reason so everything um, can maintain that cold food temperature. And don't forget to cool your foods properly before storing them in the refrigerator so it doesn't add to any warmth inside. And also keeping items six inches off the floor on racks can also help the cold air maintain proper temperatures. Thank you, Cindy. Let's move to our second issue, which is related to this, but it gets a little more specific. And this one is that cooling pans that we cool food within would be filled too deeply 
to allow for proper chilling. So what's the problem here? Well, quite obviously, this prevents chilling of those cooked food items to the less than 41 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, which is required. We know this is cited some of the time. We know this can lead to growth of pathogens, such as Clostridium perfringens or Bacillus cereus. And generally, these kinds of cells will grow much faster than other kinds of bacteria, and it's consumption of large numbers of these cells that can cause illness. And actually, hot off the press, I was on a phone call yesterday with some health officials from a particular state who reported preliminary data of a study they have done surveying restaurants within that state, and they found that when food was in pans that were three inches or less, that 83% of that food met the cooling requirements of that particular state. On the flip side, when food was in pans that was filled higher than three inches, only 45% of the time were they able to meet those same sorts of cooling requirements. So here, the depth of the food in the in the pans is very, very important. And this comes to light as we think about an outbreak that occurred recently where Clostridium perfringens was linked to a beef product that made 19 people sick. And in this case, it was a caterer who prepared food the day before a lunch. Meats were partially cooked, were marinated overnight, and then in the morning they were cooked before the lunch. And illnesses started about six inches after eating. One of the likely contributors, in addition to the others you'll see on the slide here, was that the stacked containers of this beef item were completely filled with cooked food, which certainly didn't allow for sufficient air circulation and certainly exceeded uh, the, say, three-inch depth of food that we might uh, want to suggest as a best practice. But let's hear from Cindy now on some practical solutions on addressing this problem. Thank you, Ruth. Well, it's a common practice for staff simply not taking the time to cool foods properly. Uh, very busy in their kitchen tasks, and it's very easy to leave foods in their original large containers or leave a large roast out on the counter to cool down uh, after cooking. We want to make sure that um, if someone is making an ice bath to cool foods, that it's done correctly as well. It's very common to see a large container of food, very deep, much larger than three inches, sitting on top of a pile of ice, which really does not um, help the cooling process much at all. So we want to make sure that the ice in a bath is deep enough around the food container. So that's some best practices to avoid these issues. Our target cooling rate, of course, is to cool foods from 135 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit within two hours and then continue to cool those foods in the next four hours. And this actually translates to a cooling rate of about a half a degree a minute. So as you're monitoring the Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So as we're monitoring the food temperatures as they're cooling, we can uh, look at that half a degree drop a minute to make sure we're cooling it down properly. And if you are using an ice bath around a food container, we want to make sure that the ice is stacked high enough around the food to reach the top level of the food. Cooling paddles can help tremendously, inserting it into a, a large stock pot, but we want to make sure that we're stirring that ice paddle continuously for a period to make sure that the interior of the food is, is getting cooled as well. Spreading foods out in shallow layers, no higher than three inches deep, is very effective. Cutting a large roast into pieces will help increase the surface area for cooling foods better. And once the temperature of the food is 70 degrees approximately, it's usually safe to refrigerate it at that point, as long as the container is not too deep or too large in volume. Great, thank you, Cindy. Now on to the next one, the idea of non-calibrated thermometers. We know that 
if a thermometer is not calibrated appropriately, it can cause false readings of those temperatures. And it's estimated that perhaps as many as a third of food thermometer recordings may be incorrect. So it's something that we need to be paying attention to because certainly time temperature abuse of foods can lead to illness. And it really gets down to if these potentially hazardous foods or temperature control for safety foods are held between 41 degrees and 135 degrees for more than four hours, we know that hazardous bacteria such as Clostridium perfringens or Bacillus cereus can grow and produce toxins that cause illness. And as an example, there was a pasta salad which was prepared on a Friday for a picnic that was going to occur the next day. But as is often occurs, there were leftovers which were refrigerated, but the refrigerator was too warm, that is above 41 degrees, and then they were consumed a couple days later on Monday. This improper refrigeration, which was not detected because the thermometer was not working properly, allowed for high levels of Bacillus cereus to grow and to form toxin, which then resulted in five family members getting sick and a child unfortunately dying. So it is really important to make sure thermometers are calibrated appropriately in order to avoid issues like this. But Cindy, how do we do this? Well, looking at the, the reasons for non-calibrated thermometers, it, it's sometimes just simple neglect for staff to test the accuracy of the thermometers before they're using them, or having old, outdated food thermometers that haven't been used in years. And as far as the thermometers that are built into walk-ins or reach-in refrigerators or displayed on the outside walls, these are often inaccurate or broken but staff depend on these built-in equipment thermometers to um, test the safety of the foods inside. Risky practice there. And so also some staff have a lack of knowledge about how to calibrate a thermometer for accuracy and if some models can even be calibrated at all. So some best practices to ensure that your thermometers are reading accurate temperatures, having staff verify the accuracy of food thermometers before using with either the ice point or the boiling water method, and train staff to calibrate bimetallic stemmed thermometers, tell them how to do it and how often to do it, approximately once a week. Digital thermometers should be calibrated according to the manufacturer's instructions, but some digital models cannot be calibrated in the field, and if that's the case, they have to be sent back to the manufacturer for calibration or simply replace them as needed. And as far as the thermometers built into coolers and walk-ins, we should be taking the internal food temperatures regularly, and if they're consistently too high, in spite of the reading on the equipment thermometer itself, we should probably call in maintenance and have that cooler repaired. Um, perhaps the compressors, coolants, or thermometers themselves may need servicing. Great, thank you, Cindy. Okay, on to issue number four, improper handling of produce. Obviously, improper handling can cause it to become unsafe and lead to foodborne illness. And the reality is, if we think just about lettuce as an example, we eat a lot of it here in the U.S. It's estimated that more than 8 million pounds are grown domestically, and this translates to a consumption rate of 26 pounds that each of us consumes on an annual basis. The good news is that the vast majority of all of this lettuce, again, as an example, is very safe. Growers are following proper practices. There is more research being done every day that informs these practices. And in addition, there's very sound handling that's done by processors who receive in all this lettuce, for example, from the fields. That, and these practices include commercial washing with approved antimicrobial chemicals, which do a lot to reduce risks. But sometimes those of us who receive this lettuce may wonder about how we need to handle it to make sure it's safe for the patrons that we're serving. And it's really recommended by experts, and there's been published work on this, 
that if produce has been washed upstream, that is by the processor, that it not be rewashed. Because uh, as FDA states, it's really unlikely that washing of these kinds of products will really make the product any cleaner. And it's possible, in fact, that it may lead to further contamination of the product, which was already cleaned. So if it's not pre-washed, though, we do need to wash and handle it carefully to avoid contamination. And there's a couple examples here shown on the right-hand side of the slide. If lettuce, for example, or other produce has been washed by the processor, it will say so. For example, as shown in this label of triple washed butter lettuce. Unwashed produce is more like the example on the bottom right of heads of iceberg lettuce, which frankly are picked directly from the field right into shipping containers like this that then come into the restaurant or retail setting just like this. This is the kind of produce that needs to be washed upon receipt. But Cindy, what, what causes this improper handling and, and what do we do about it? Well, thank you, Ruth. There, there is a lot of misinformation about which produce items need washing and which do not. It's important to understand the difference here. A lot of operators don't trust that their prepared packaged produce have been washed properly and they watch, wash these packaged items again unnecessarily. On the other hand, as you mentioned, most bulk fruits and vegetables are packed fresh right at the farm level and do need washing before use. And a lot of operators don't understand that either. Um, having a lack of a dedicated produce sink can contaminate produce in the washing process. For example, if um, an operator or a restaurant only has one sink for draining chicken, draining raw meat juices, the sink and surrounding areas are contaminated and then contaminate the produce. So how do we get around these? First rule of thumb should be don't, do not rewash commercially processed packaged produce. Most retail packs have been previously washed by the packer and are usually labeled as such as Ruth just mentioned. But you should check with your vendors on bulk produce items as some cases of produce items may have been previously washed. For example, bulk cases of mixed greens packed for a large food service operation are sometimes pre-washed but might not be labeled as such. So in cases like this, uh, like this, your vendor can provide those specifications for you, whether you need to uh, further wash the produce or not. When washing unwashed produce, it seems kind of a crazy term, clean and sanitize your sinks and strainers before washing to make sure that they're not getting further contaminated and make sure that employees wash their own hands before wash washing these items. Using clean potable water and friction, and an antimicrobial produce wash provides extra protection to reduce pathogens on the surface, if you like. Research shows that when washing fruits and vegetables, the water temperature should be a little bit warmer than the item itself, um, about 10 degrees warmer than the produce item itself. And this is because if the water is too cold, pathogens from the surface can be absorbed into the flesh of the fruit or vegetable, and this has been implicated in a number of outbreaks and recalls. And there is a great article published by recently by Ecolab professionals Anna Starobin and Sally Foon Cunningham on fruit and vegetable washing in retail environments, and this reference is included at the bottom of the screen and has some great information for restaurants. Terrific. Thank you, Cindy. So on to the next overlooked food safety issues, and this relates to poor sanitation that might be done of ice machines. Obviously, this can be linked to many problems. Although we don't have reports of illnesses that are directly tied to ice, we do have illnesses and have situations where these have been linked to contaminated water or by handling of such items by humans. And we certainly know that dirty ice machines could exacerbate some of these issues. Also, dirty ice machines are frequently cited by inspectors. In fact, it's the number one reason 
for unclean food contact surfaces that's reported by health inspectors. And often there's little guidance or consistency in guidance in how we handle ice machines and how we maintain and, and clean them from ice machine manufacturers. And then certainly, if anybody follows social media, as likely we all do, dirty ice machines frequently are targeted by the media highlighting such issues. And obviously it leads to consumer outrage. And we pulled a couple recent headlines related to this very topic um, that are quite alarming um, and certainly would be a turnoff to consumers uh, uh, choosing to eat at a particular restaurant or just overall probably unnecessary but, but realistic kinds of fears related to ice. So this needs to be avoided as well. But Cindy, how do we do that? Well, some common mistakes uh, that can lead to the ice becoming contaminated in the first place are ice scoops stored directly in the ice bin or on unsanitary soiled surfaces, employees handling ice with their bare hands, which is a big no-no, or the glass itself, which could shatter and, and contaminate the ice, not using a designated ice bucket for storing ice and, and transporting ice, and also not having a regular cleaning schedule for the ice machine itself. Some simple solutions for these, having a bucket designated for handling ice that's kept clean, using only clean scoops to handle ice, and using a hanger or a holder for storing these scoops. Don't store the scoops in the ice bin itself. And don't store anything in the ice bin except clean, untouched ice. No water bottles, no soda cans, no wine bottles, just clean ice. And having a monthly schedule for cleaning the bins and changing the filters is very, very helpful, following the manufacturer's instructions, of course. And using an ice wand in the machine can help reduce mold and slime in the machine itself and keep the ice sanitary. There's a good reference um, at the bottom. Oh, where is this reference? I don't know if it can be seen, but Coca-Cola provided some great information and tips for cleaning ice bins on the soda fountain dispensers. I thought it was sure. here, but maybe we'll provide that later. Yeah, it, we certainly can. It looks like it's a little hidden in the bottom. Mm -hmm. of the, but anyway, um, thanks, Cindy. So the next one. How about issues with garnishes that might be used on these lovely looking drinks that we all enjoy, certainly in the summertime, but, but certainly as, as the cooler temperatures are coming. Um, these are realities of these, these fun beverages we enjoy. Um, what can be issues with use of these garnishes, uh, how they're handled, how they're stored, et cetera? Because the reality is that they can pose risks if they're not handled properly. Often these are prepared at a bar, and you can imagine how busy bars sometimes get, and they may be stored, frankly, at ambient temperature in easy reach for the bartender to use as they're preparing beverages. There is a potential risk from improper storage of these. In fact, there was recent research just published earlier this year that evaluated survival of salmonella on slices of citrus items that, which were held at room temperature and even at refrigerator temperatures. And what they found is that there was growth of salmonella in the slices which were stored at 70 degrees, which is a fairly cool-ish room temperature kind of storage. And then they were able to demonstrate transfer to beverages uh, of that salmonella that was on these ice, uh, sorry, on these citrus slices. They saw no such growth when these were stored at 41 degrees. So we do need to be aware of the characteristics of these garnishes and whether they might be a temperature control for safety food. And as we all know, this is foods with a water activity value of 0.85 or less, or a pH of 4.6 or less when measured at 75 degrees. And certainly these foods need to be held either hot, above 135, which probably isn't practical for a bar garnish, or held cold 
which is really the practice we would want to do, and certainly not held out of temperature control for more than four hours. And just as a point of reference, copied in here on the right-hand side of the slide are some typical pH values for some of these different food items that might be used as garnishes in these beverages. You can see, for example, um, although the research demonstrated growth in citrus, um, typically it is not considered a potentially hazardous food, nor are olives, green olives anyway, but other kinds of olives maybe, and as we get into to some of the other items, it's important to be aware of these particular characteristics. So use this primarily as a guide for yourselves and make sure you're aware of this information. But Cindy, what are other practical tips? So some reasons for garnishes not being handled or stored properly in, in bar areas is simply bar areas are often overlooked as far as food safety goes and bar staff are not often train in food safety when compared to food handlers, food workers in the kitchen, for example, where it's required by law. So bar safety is sometimes an area that's, that's overlooked, um, not only for temperature controls of the items that is, as you mentioned, Ruth, but cross-contamination of all of the items, garnishes and, and other items in the bar area. Very often there's a lack of space in the bar area for cutting and handling items. Um, garnishes are cut on contaminated surfaces. They don't have accessible toothpicks or napkins or gloves is a typical practice for handling garnishes and items, bare hands are used. Hand sinks are often filled with ice and used for storing bottles or soiled glasses. And there's just a general lack of attention to preventing cross-contamination, never mind keeping garnishes cold. Some simple solutions in the bars, training personnel on food safety practices just as other food handlers are required. And this seems to become more and more important as food and meals are served in bars more than ever before. So these bartenders are food handlers of sorts many times. Items, garnishes, lemons, limes, uh, any items in the bar should be cut on cleaned and sanitized surfaces and bar boards, and any TCS items should be refrigerated until serving. Not only citrus items and olives, ideally, but definitely shrimp that might be added to um, a drink or a lobster tails. I'm from the Northeast, so we have lobster sometimes and Bloody Marys, and all of these TCS items should be um, refrigerated, of course, before serving. Using toothpicks, napkins, or gloves for handling garnishes can help prevent contamination from bare hands, especially if they're not always washed. Designated hand sink in the bar area for washing hands only is very, very important so that after handling dirty glasses or shucking oysters um, or cleaning bar items, folks are not contaminating garnishes and glasses with dirty hands. And storing wiping cloths and sanitizing buckets or using disposable wipes to clean bar, bar surfaces. Terrific, thank you, Cindy. Go on to the next one. How about the cleanliness of self-service areas such as buffets, uh, and salad bars, and the like? The reality is that contamination of surfaces such as areas like these is important in managing because we know that improper handling here may contribute to as many or as much as 13% of all foodborne illnesses per the CDC. Of these kinds of surfaces, the food code requires at least an every 24 hour cleaning, assuming the temperature is maintained, and that's a very, very important assumption. I pulled in here the citations from the food code, and it's important to keep in mind that cleanliness of food contact surfaces is cited about 20% of the time by inspectors. And of non-food contact surfaces, so those peripheral areas that may be close to these buffets is cited perhaps as much as 22% of the time. So certainly these data indicate that attention is needed, but we need to combine 
that lack of attention with other possible risks, such as temperature control and personal hygiene, which, as shown in the graphic on the right-hand side of this slide, also do contribute to foodborne illness. And it's often the collective interaction of these different factors that leads to illness. So, Cindy, what do we do about this? Well, understanding the causes for these unclean self-service areas can point to solutions, right? These areas can be extremely busy and get a lot of traffic with customers, and they're often neglected due to the self-serve nature of the buffets, drink stations, utensil and condiment stations. They sort of run by themselves, so they're easy to ignore. In a buffet line, Serving utensils are often stored outside of the food container or on a plate because it looks a little bit fancier, or sometimes they simply fall out, which can add to the mess, spilled foods, and cross-contamination of not only the area but foods and containers themselves. And if there is inadequate staffing, it's easy to overlook these self-service areas. So very helpful would be to assign specific personnel to monitor and clean these areas, buffets, salad bars, condiment stations. In a utensil station, storing eating utensils in containers with the handles up or offer prepackaged utensils or utensil dispensers can help keep the parts that touch people's mouths clean. In a food bar, Keep serving utensils stored in the food containers themselves with the handles up. Not only will help keep the areas clean and the food safe, um, the, 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 the serving portion of the utensil will be sitting in the food, ideally at the same temperature as the food itself, hot or cold, and will not tend to grow bacteria as easily or contaminate other, other areas. And having sanitized wiping cloths or disposable cleaning wipes accessible for cleaning these areas frequently is a must. Great. All right, number eight. How about lack of isolation of allergens? And this is a significant problem and public health issue because improper handling of allergenic foods can lead to health issues. We know that it is a that Issues with allergens are a top cause of recalls and of adverse reactions in humans that are attributed to food. In fact, in the U.S., it's estimated there's 12.5 million individuals who have food allergies. About 4% of adults are estimated to have food allergies and perhaps as many as 6 to 8% of young children. This results in about 50,000 anaphylactic or very serious reactions that head to emergency rooms each year. And unfortunately, this may account for as many or more uh, than 200 deaths each year. Challenge is there's no known cure for allergies. Now, I think we're all familiar with the big eight categories of allergens. And I think it's an interesting study that was done a number of years ago by researchers from the University of Nebraska where they surveyed general population and young children to find out what kinds of allergies were more likely to exist. Curiously, among children, which is the blue bars shown on the graph, milk, egg, and peanut was much more prevalent among the general population, that is, adults uh, and people older than young children. Uh, we saw shrimp uh, and some of the nuts and fish items predominate. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, milk and egg would not be seen among adults, but that the frequency or occurrence does seem to go down. And I think that helps explain why we see a lesser percent of adults who are impacted by food allergies. Also, the reality of young children eating shrimp uh, is probably not all that common. So I think that uh, has an impact on the data as well. But regardless, this gives us some ideas about uh, what issues may exist and it's something that certainly needs to be taken seriously given the public health ramifications of this. And restaurants play a big role in doing this. So, Cindy, what are some practices that must be followed? Yes. Well, isolating allergens in the kitchen is particularly challenging, especially since allergens are everywhere. You mentioned the eight major allergens, but over 170 foods 
have been found to cause allergic reactions. So it's not practical to eliminate them completely from kitchens or our recipes. There's also a lack of knowledge about the seriousness of allergens and gluten and the importance of preventing cross-contact and just how to do that. It's also misunderstood um, that cookware and hot oils um, do not destroy the proteins causing the allergic reactions. It's heat nor sanitizing alone destroys the protein that can cause adverse health effects. And so improper cleaning of equipment, cutting boards before using for someone with a food sensitivity is a, a common um, occurrence in food, food establishments. Some best practices, communicating between kitchen staff and customers about their dietary concerns is a key. Make sure customers are informing whoever is preparing their meal what their dietary concerns are so they can be um, alleviated. Preventing cross-contact, making safe recipe substitutions, and reading ingredient labels can help avoid inclusion in any um, recipe. Proper cleaning of equipment, pans, utensils, cutting boards before using for someone with a food allergy or use equipment specifically designated for these cases and, and again, make sure they are clean. Use separate cooking oils and friolators. If someone, if a customer comes in and they say they have a shrimp allergy, so they will just have French fries, but it's cooked in the same friolator as the restaurant's using to cook shrimp, the proteins from the shrimp will survive and they'll be floating around in the hot oil clinging to the fries and could potentially cause a reaction. So restaurant staff need to understand the importance of separating cookware and oils. And attaching a, an allergy label on finished plates as shown in this picture here can help alert customers that this meal has been prepared safely without a particular ingredient and as a reminder to staff as they're delivering food to the tables that this particular plate is, um, has been prepared safely without a particular allergen. And staff training is, is critical on what causes allergic reactions, how to prevent cross-contact, and what to do in case of an allergic reaction. And using visual aids such as kitchen posters or booklets to help remind and train your staff is very, very helpful. Ruth? Great tip. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, our last one here is failure to keep drink dispensers clean. And this is really a fairly broad area. If you think about how many different sorts of beverages are served in a typical food service establishment, certainly soda uh, nozzles are one of those, um, beer nozzles and so on, but also um, tea urns um, and other dispensers that might be used. We know that dirty dispensers can certainly allow contaminants which may build up in these to flow right into the beverages which are dispensed. And certainly not keeping these clean can affect public health, but it also may affect the taste of the beverages which would be served. And we know that these, can, uh, these dispensers can harbor things like E. coli and yeast and mold, which certainly would impact the taste of a beverage. And over and above that, we know there's, uh, similar to the ice machine concerns, much negative publicity that occurs related to this whole idea, whole, whole area of drink dispensers. And again, we pulled some headlines from recent um, news, um, news areas where they have gone in and actually done some tests, and the headlines are quite alarming um, and certainly can impact the uh, reputation of an establishment that might be associated with these. So it's important to keep these clean. But how do we do this, Cindy? Well, as you mentioned, Ruth, these tend to be very high volume areas with a lot of touch points by many individuals. And when staff have time constraints, again, it's easy to overlook these drink nozzles and dispensers. Um, if, when they get gunky, if someone's busy, they're moving on to the next area very quickly. So this lack of oversight and of staff on, on the cleanliness of these areas is, is a common occurrence. Also, um, sometimes they overlook areas outside of the soda fountain nozzles, as, as you mentioned, coffee dispensers, tea, milk dispensers, and liquor bottles and pourers in the bar areas can often um, 
build up residue and be unclean. So we want to look at some simple best practices for cleaning nozzles and dispensers. We want to do them daily for all beverage dispensers. Have a regular cleaning schedule for these areas, ideally at the end of every shift. And this would include not only dispensers for soda fountains and nozzles and coffee, tea, milk, but also the bag and box syrups containers and bottle pourers and spouts in the bar that can um, have some syrup residue which can attract contaminants and pests. The person in charge at the food establishment should include monitoring the drink areas and bars daily as part of their tasks. It might be appropriate to cover pourers and spouts of uh, bottles and dispensers overnight to prevent contamination. And if a food establishment has a pest control program, that can certainly help to detect problems. Fruit flies, bar flies, cockroaches are often attracted to these beverage residues. And if there's a presence of these, it might signal a need for better cleaning in these areas. Great, thank you. Good practical tips. Well, really, we've come to the end of our particular issues we wanted to go through, and we're eager to hear questions that may have been submitted. And I will add my reminder to you to please type your questions into the Q&A panel on the side of your screen. But we do just want to leave you with a few different resources that can help minimize your overall food safety risks. The U.S. Food Code published by FDA in the most recent version came out in 2017 really is a good resource that can be helpful and, and give you good advice about practices to follow. In addition, the FDA also publishes what's called a reference system. And this is a searchable database that provides a little bit more insights into how FDA might interpret various parts of the food code in response to questions that have come in from inspection staff, from uh, regulated entities, and so on. And, um, that can be found quite easily by, by searching for FDA food code reference system and gives you a nice database of information there. In addition, from Ecolab, we have a library of what we call microbial risks fact sheets. And if you Googled microbial risks uh, and Ecolab, you would find these. And these are a series of about 20 to 25 different um, one to two page uh, informational pieces related to things like Clostridium perfringens and Bacillus cereus, which we talked about. There's one on Salmonella uh, and many, many other kinds of risks that you may want to learn more about that includes very practical tips, um, including many of those that Cindy outlined here. So now uh, we're towards the end, but we do now have time for questions. And I will pass this to Valerie for a couple comments prior to our questions. Okay, thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, thank you, Ruth and Cindy. This has all been really great information. Um, it was great to hear both the science behind each of the issues and then uh, really the practical, the causes and the practical solutions to prevent uh, the problem and to minimize risk. So thank you uh, both for uh, sharing. So just to close out with a couple of comments before we go on to the uh, Q&A, uh, all of these issues that were reviewed today, what they have in common is that they're very easy uh, to overlook and they can be easily overlooked because uh, they're not top of mind given all of the other concerns and the demands uh, on the attention and time of the food service operator. Uh, but um, they can still be a real concern for food safety, so addressing them can really go a long way to having a strong and holistic um, food safety program in place. And really the value of uh, having a strong food safety program is that uh, while you're reducing the risk of foodborne illnesses and regulatory violations or food code violations, um, you're at the same time uh, increasing the opportunity uh, to grow your business. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So really the benefits of having a strong food safety program in place is that um, it can help power your performance and 
And what that means is that a strong food safety program can help you achieve uh, some of the long-term uh, business outcomes that are important uh, to you, and those are delighting your guests, uh, protecting the reputation of your business, and optimizing uh, your operations. Uh, so with that, thanks again to the presenters, and now we're going to turn it over to Annie for Q&A. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you, Ruth and Cindy as well for all the information. It's great uh, information to know, and the resources um, will serve a great source as well for people to get more information. Uh, we do have some questions from the attendees, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time remaining. Um, please keep in mind you can enter questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom right of your screen. And one other quick note before um, we move on into the questions is make sure to complete the survey that pops up after the webinar uh, to ensure that you are able to receive your uh, free CEUs for attending this webinar. Uh, the first question that we have today is, what temp do you recommend food be at when placing it in the refrigerator? Well, before Cindy? placing food in the refrigerator, this is Cindy. Um, it's, it's important to remember the, the guidelines is cooling foods um, in the first two hours to 70 degrees, and then the next four hours from 70 to 41. Ideally, it should be 41 degrees. If you do have the opportunity to refrigerate a food that's not too large in volume, in the refrigerator, you should monitor it to make sure that it still meets that critical um, time limit for cooling within the next four hours. But you should not, should not refrigerate anything until it is at least cooled down to 70 degrees. Thank you. Uh, the next question asks, do you think the definition of a TCS food is misleading for food service operations because of the recent findings related to to the citrus fruit supporting bacteria growth, and what would the typical health department's response to citrus fruits over 41 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, I can start with this, um, but I'll ask Cindy as well to, to weigh in. Um, I've just taken a look at the research which was published in uh, that I quoted earlier, and um, I think what's important to keep in mind is that what that research showed is a slight emphasis on slight amount of growth, um, probably not significant, frankly, but more so what it allowed was survival of salmonella on these different kinds of citruses. And it did vary by kind of citrus. So this gets back to really knowing the criteria and the characteristics of the particular item that you're thinking about. Um, we know today because of consumer preferences, there are um, breeding programs being on that frankly are, are uh, enabling the production of lower acid citrus products today as people want less tart kinds of citrus items to be available to them. Um, that can be a factor. So it, I would not argue against um, or, or in favor, rather, of changing the definition of a TCS food, but more so on the side of <clears throat> making sure you're very aware of the characteristics of the particular variety and kind of citrus and other sorts of food items that you might be looking at storing uh, in a room temperature situation. Cindy, what I'd can like, you? I'd like to add, yeah, I'd like to add yeah. one thing to that. On your slide, you also mentioned um, discarding any foods after four hours sitting out at room yep. temperature. And this would include citrus because, as you mentioned, salmonella and other pathogens can survive and proliferate on these items. And even though they might not be a TCS food in true definition, after four hours, they are still there. And if you consume them, they still can possibly make someone sick. So as a rule of thumb, if you're cutting oranges or lemons or olives, if they're not used up quickly within four hours, it may be a good idea to, to discard them and rotate them out with a new product. As far as what the health department's response might be, I think it's hard to say uh, generally what they might do, but, but I think we've given you some ideas 
they will potentially be asking for data about why it could be justifiable to store such items without temperature control. So that information could be made available. Um, on a more realistic basis, um, I think they're, they're, if you're following the practices that Cindy has outlined, they are less likely to, um, one, be asking for that, and two, be all that concerned about it. Okay, the next question, uh, can you further explain why washing pre-washed produce is a no-no? The research showed that in general, the likelihood of potential cross-contamination and essentially negating the, the good practices um, and good risk management strategies which would have come out of washing um, might go away because sinks may not be as clean as they should be, hands may not be sufficiently washed. We know there's data related to how um, some of these practices are carried out. So it's far better to rely on the fact that the processor uh, downstream from your restaurant operations would have handled things appropriately and rely on them to take care of this for you because of the potential for all of these other kinds of behaviors not to have been done well. Thank you. Uh, this is a follow-up question for Cindy. Should the drip cup that the bar soda gun dispenser sits in be cleaned daily as well as the actual nozzle? Could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yes. Uh, should the drip cup that the bar soda gun dispenser sits in be cleaned daily as well as the actual nozzle? Ideally, yes. It should be because as the nozzles are sitting in there, they're collecting whatever was on the nozzle and they should be cleaned just as well. They're food contact surfaces essentially. Okay. Um, let's see. What recommendations do you have to maintain food safety in food delivery situations? Um, good questions, as we're seeing more and more of that. Um, there is a lot of guidance being either published or being developed as we speak. Um, in fact, there's a conference for food protection committee that will make recommendations to FDA at the upcoming CFP meeting next April in Denver. So a lot of this, frankly, is being worked on right now. But in the interim, the CDC did publish some information uh, a couple of months ago related to tips for meal kit and food delivery safety, and it focused around um, many of the things we talked about today in principle, making sure that temperatures are maintained, um, making sure that the containers and the packaging within which those foods are stored is, uh, is not tampered with and is completely sealed. Um, making sure that um, handling is done properly of those foods once they get into your homes, um, et cetera. And, um, you know, following many of the same practices as far as cleaning effectively, separating raw and uh, processed foods, cooking, and then chilling appropriately as well. Thank you. Um, we have time for just probably a couple more. Um, this one is asking if the link shared for the FDA 2017 code is the same for all states? No. The, well, federal code, the federal code can be accessed at FDA 2017 food code. That is a federally published document by FDA. Each state um, may choose to publish their own version of the food code. Sometimes they adopt the food code that the FDA would publish uh, in its entirety. Sometimes, like the state of Minnesota where I live, um, we have our own food code, so one would need to go to the state of Minnesota's uh, health or ag department's websites to find the Minnesota food code, for example. Okay, uh, let's see, probably have time for one more. Um, will the local Department of Health inspectors accept the use of an ice wand to prevent growth of bacteria? In an ice machine? In an ice machine, I assume. 
they're talking about, right? Um, ice, yes, oh, it does an not ice paddle, it. an ice wander, ice paddle for cooling. Again, as long as cooling is done within those certain parameters, done within two hours to 70 and four hours to 41, and the ice wand is used properly to expedite the cooling, it's a tool that can expedite the cooling process just as shallow layers and an ice bath would be. It's all about cooling it down in the proper time frame. Thank you very much. Um, that's all that we have time for today. For those of you who submitted questions that were not answered, we will follow up after the webinar. Uh, thank you again. Please make sure to complete the survey that pops up as you close out. And we look forward to our next webinar in December. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today's webinar. This concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect your lines and have a nice day.